You have got to be shitting me. They made another one? God damn it, Michael Bay. Why do you keep doing this? Why can't you just let it die? Why must you keep ruining the Transformers again and again and again? Damn you, economics! Okay, I guess I can't blame him entirely. I mean, these movies basically are a license to print money. Anyone else in his situation would probably do the same thing. <clears throat> well, if he's gonna keep making them, I guess I gotta keep tearing them down. So, let's do this. This is the fourth... fourth installment in the Michael Bay Transformers saga, Age of Extinction. Now here is probably the most important change from the previous films in the series. No Shia LaBeouf. By Darwin's beard, there may be hope for this movie yet. Instead of Mr. No, 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 etc., etc., we have Cade Yeager, played by Marky Mark Wahlberg. Admittedly, he's not among my favorite actors, but he's certainly better than Shia. And at least he can pass for a legitimate action star. I mean, look at this guy. Look at this fucking guy. His biceps are as big as my head. And it certainly helps that his character is, for the most part, a likable guy. Though perhaps not the smartest guy on the planet. That's not to say he's not intelligent. He is. But if Dungeons and Dragons has taught me anything, there's a difference between intelligence and wisdom. Cade can build or fix pretty much anything and spends most of his spare time coming up with pretty cool inventions in his barn, which appears to be a TARDIS as it's much bigger on the inside. But perhaps he spends a little too much time in the barn in hopes of inventing that one big thing that will make his family rich instead of getting a real job that will keep his family out of the poorhouse. He also has a tendency to chase after his creditors with a baseball bat. They hate that. But despite his flaws, he is, as I said, a likable guy. Unfortunately, he's carrying quite a bit of baggage with him. First, there's his friend and co-worker Lucas, played by T.J. Miller at his T.J. Milleriest. And I normally don't mind T.J. Miller, but he is especially annoying in this movie. Almost everything this character says and does is for the sake of a lame joke. <laughs> And I'm certainly not against having comic relief in the film, but Michael Bay's track record with comedy is not exactly stellar. That being said, I will take a football to the face over dogs humping any day. Then there's his daughter Tessa, played by Nicola Peltz. To her credit, her acting has improved somewhat since... that one movie that we should never speak of again, but she still needs some work. And her character serves about the same purpose as Megan Fox and Rosie Huntington-Whitley in the previous movies. <laughs> Oh, did I mention the character is 17? Why is this movie sexualizing a 17-year-old character? And I know Miss Pelt was actually 18 when the movie was shot, but the movie goes out of its way to remind us that the character is 17, so it still feels a little... Ew. And Cade's treatment of his daughter is rather strange. He keeps Tessa extremely sheltered and prohibits her from even going on a date with a guy until she graduates high school. Evidently, Cade and his unnamed wife, who died some time ago from an unnamed illness or accident or alien abduction, I don't know, had Tessa when they were still in high school, and he doesn't want his daughter to make the same mistake he did. And yet the extreme sheltering of his daughter does not seem to extend to her wardrobe. Oh sure, he makes the occasional verbal complaint. Sweetheart, your shorts are shrinking by the second, okay? Cold water, air dry, please. But that's about the extent of his efforts to get his daughter to dress a bit more conservatively. And then there's Tessa's boyfriend. Yeah, Kate's efforts to keep his daughter from dating until graduation didn't exactly work. Imagine that. Her boyfriend is an Irish immigrant played by Jack Rayner who makes a living as a race car driver. His character does have a name, but Marky Mark spends the entire movie calling him Lucky Charms, so I shall do likewise. I suppose I should be offended by this given my own Irish heritage, but the character is kind of a douche, so fuck it. Lucky Charms is 20, by the way, and dating 17-year-old Tessa. Needless to say, Daddy is not happy when he finds out. Oh, no. Oh, but don't worry, it's okay. Because apparently Texas has some sort of Romeo and Juliet law on the books that makes their relationship perfectly legal since they started dating when they were both in high school a couple of years ago. Or some such bullshit. Lucky Charms even carries around a laminated copy of the statute. 
Seriously. Of course, the movie's interpretation of the statute is incorrect, as in reality, it's strictly about the age difference. When they started dating is inconsequential. For that matter, the entire statute is inconsequential here, since the age of consent in Texas is actually 17. But that's not the important issue. The real issue is, why is this in the movie to begin with? It certainly wasn't thrown in there for comedy, it's not funny, and I don't think it was trying to be either. And it doesn't add a damn thing to the plot, it's not necessary to create conflict between Cade and Lucky Charms, because Cade would have hated him anyway based on the simple fact that he's dating his daughter without permission. Even if you make Tess's age 18, that conflict doesn't go away. So... Is someone projecting here? I mean, I'm... It's entirely possible I'm reading way too much into this, I freely admit that. I could be wrong. But somehow I get the feeling someone involved with the production of this movie was banging a 17-year-old when he was 20 and is using this movie to somehow try to justify it. I mean, I'm not saying. I'm just saying. Anyway, let's take a look at how these characters get involved with the Transformers in the first place. To acquire some much-needed income, Kate and Lucas take a job cleaning out an old theater, and the owner of said theater has an interesting comment about today's movie industry. Sequels and remakes, bunch of crap. Get it? Because this movie is a sequel! Ha ha ha! Ha 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 while they're cleaning up the theater, they just happen to find the heavily damaged and deactivated Optimus Prime. Wait, how did he get in the theater in the first place? I'm pretty sure he wouldn't fit through the front door, and even if there was some kind of loading dock in the back that was big enough for him to crawl through, one would think someone would have noticed. Cade brings the truck back to the farm, intending to strip it for parts and sell them, but he soon realizes the truck is actually a Transformer and finds a way to fix him. So that is now twice in this franchise that Optimus Prime has been killed and resurrected. As I've said before, it kinda kills the tension when death is just a minor inconvenience. Optimus, voiced once again by Peter Cullen, explains to Cade and company that the CIA turned their backs on the Autobots some time ago and declared them enemy combatants. And since then, he's been in hiding from this man, Harold Attinger, played by Kelsey Grammer. With a special black ops group under his control, Attinger has made it his personal mission to rid planet Earth of all remaining Transformers. Never again can we allow aliens to fight our battles for us. Right, because you were doing such a great job on your own. Remember that time that the humans were able to take out the Decepticons with no help from the Autobots whatsoever? I believe it was sometime around July of 2000, never. Now I know what you're thinking. Why is Grammar slumming it in a Michael Bay Transformers movie? And you're right, he is way too good for this. But to his credit, that does not stop him from giving 110%. His performance in this movie is outstanding. Grammar is exactly what a great villain should be. He's cold, ruthless, very intimidating, and willing to get the job done at any cost. When the CIA tracks Optimus to Cade's farm, he does not hesitate to order his Lieutenant Savoy to put a gun to Tessa's head and threaten to blow her fucking brains out if Cade does not tell them where Optimus is hiding. And he's apparently not afraid to get his own hands dirty if need be. What's the other version of this conversation? When you send in the hired help to murder my little girl? Or are you gonna man up and do it yourself? What's your preference? Damn! And speaking of Attinger's number two, James Savoy, played by Titus Welliver, is a very intimidating character in his own right, which is impressive considering screenwriter Aaron Kruger didn't exactly give him the best lines to work with. Search the property! What do you mean, search the property? You don't have a warrant. My face. My war. My face is. The hell does that even mean? Anyway, Attinger and company have been hunting down and killing the last remaining Autobots on Earth with the help of Lockdown, a bounty hunter transformer who has come to Earth to capture Optimus Prime and bring him back to the Creators, whoever the hell they are. Perhaps the Quintessons? And no, I have no idea why Lockdown feels the need to work with the humans to find Optimus Prime. I mean, he should be able to do it on his own. Can't he just 
track Optimus Prime using his Energon radiation like they did in the previous movies? Or did he leave his Energon detector in his other pants? I don't know. I also don't know why Attinger feels the need to work with Lockdown, considering... Never again can we allow aliens to fight our battles for us. Funny how quickly he forgot about that. So after Savoy threatens to execute Tessa, Prime decides to make his presence known, and Lucky Charms just happens to show up at the right time and helps everyone escape. After a chase that sees our so-called heroes crashing through a bingo hall, way to endanger innocent civilian lives, assholes, Lucky's car is destroyed and Lockdown tries to take them out. Shockingly, Lucas does not survive. Yeah, the comedy sidekick does not stick around to annoy us for the entire movie. He gets killed off about 45 minutes in. And in a pretty horrifying fashion, too. I certainly did not see that coming. I kind of feel sorry for him, actually. Can't believe I just said that. So our heroes drive out into the desert and Optimus scans a passing truck and magically heals himself of all damage. And this movie is now officially a video game. Just grab a health pack and you're back in business. And they meet up with the rest of the Autobots who have apparently just been hanging out in the desert all this time. And in very close proximity to each other. How was Lockdown not able to find these guys? Apart from Optimus, it looks like they didn't put much effort into hiding. Naturally, we have some new Autobots in this movie because merchandising, merchandising, And they are Hound, a gruff militaristic robot with a beer gut and a cigar, voiced by John Goodman. How is a robot able to smoke? Drift, a samurai robot voiced by Ken Watanabe and also the first triple changer in the series. And Crosshairs, a paratrooper voiced by John DiMaggio doing his best Jason Statham impression. And of course, Bumblebee is back. And of course, he still can't talk because the filmmakers still haven't realized the joke is dead. By taking a closer look at the bad guy's equipment, our heroes discover it came from a company called KSI, which is led by genius inventor Joshua Joyce, played by Stanley Tucci. Yet another actor who is giving this movie a performance far better than it deserves. But what else would you expect from Tucci? His company is experimenting with the material that makes up the Transformers, an alien element which Tucci calls Transformium. Sorry, James Cameron's Avatar. You used to hold the title for dumbest name for an element with unobtainium, but it looks like Transformium is our new champion. And they've learned how to manipulate the Transformium to create pretty much anything they can imagine, including blatant product placement. Come to think of it, there's a lot of product placement in this movie. Even Chinese product placement, if you can believe it. These movies may have had hints of racism in the past, but when it comes to currency, they do not discriminate. Naturally, the ultimate goal is to use the Transformium to build their own Transformers, and they've been able to build several prototypes thanks to the data they've downloaded from the brains of deceased Transformers. They're getting help decoding said data from, oh, god damn it, Brains is back! Why is Brains back? No wonder they were willing to kill off the comedy sidekick. They had a backup waiting in the wings. This is illegal experimentation. Aliens would never do this to people. Eat you, kill you, maybe, but that's it. This is bad comedy. Anyway, the Autobots decide the KSI production facility has got to go and they attack. On the advice of Attinger, who is working closely with Joyce, KSI deploys their newly created Transformer Galvatron to fight the Autobots, even though it hasn't been tested in the field yet. Oh, and did I mention the data they used to build this new Transformer was downloaded from Megatron's brain? Gee, I certainly hope nothing goes wrong. Oh shit, something went wrong. Who could have predicted? If you're familiar with the Transformers mythos, this won't come as a surprise, but Galvatron is Megatron reborn in a new body. And he's voiced by Frank Welker, the original voice of Megatron. Yay! And this also means, like Optimus Prime, Megatron has been killed and resurrected twice. This is a fucking joke at this point. Galvatron is not able to take out the Autobots, but he does distract them long enough for Lockdown to fly in and capture Optimus Prime. And he inadvertently gets Tessa as well. Break the glass! Break the glass to get out! I'm tapping it as lightly as possible, but it just won't break! Now that Lockdown has Optimus, he rewards the humans for their help with a device he calls a Seed. When detonated, this seed will wipe out all life within several kilometers and convert the land into Transformium, 
giving KSI enough material for 100 years. And a flashback informs us that a similar device was detonated on Earth when aliens visited the planet millions of years ago. And this is apparently what killed the dinosaurs. Yeah, really. And it possibly created the Dinobots as well? I think it's really not very clear. And if it didn't, then I have no idea what the fuck it has to do with anything. But hey, these movies have never made any sense before. Why would they start now? Cade, Lucky Charms, and the Autobots mount a rescue mission, and Cade acquires a neat-looking alien sword gun in the process. After a cool-looking but unnecessarily long sequence, they grab Optimus and Tessa, hijack a smaller craft from Lockdown's ship, and escape just as Lockdown blasts off into deep space. And unnecessarily long is a great way to describe this movie in general. This is the longest of Michael Bay's Transformers movies, clocking in at 2 hours and 45 minutes. And boy does it feel like it. There are long sequences of characters just talking and talking and talking and not really accomplishing much of anything. And even when something actually does happen, it's not always terribly exciting. The rescue sequence, for example, begins with the Autobots and Cade and Lucky Charms just wandering throughout Lockdown's ship searching for Optimus and Tessa. And even though in reality it only takes them a few minutes, it still feels much longer. The movie has a serious problem with pacing. Back at KSI, Joyce is not happy about Galvatron apparently going rogue and causing civilian casualties during their little field test. You know what a flaw is, Wembley? A flaw? A flaw is a total failure. Mr. Joyce, I think your dictionary has a misprint. Since the incident will undoubtedly bring the feds down upon his operation and Attinger's plan to eradicate the Autobots will be exposed, they decide to pack everything up and head to KSI's headquarters in China. And of course, they take Galvatron with them. Gee, I certainly hope nothing goes wrong. Again. Galvatron! Oh shit, something went wrong. Again. Humans is stupid. While Galvatron proceeds to tear shit up and assumes control of the other Transformium prototypes, it finally dawns on Joyce that maybe, just maybe, mind you, Attinger is an asshole. So he decides to take the seed and give it to the Autobots. But Galvatron wants the seed for himself so he can detonate it in a large city and kill a shitload of people. Because... evil. And when our heroes fly into China, Galvatron and his new army of Decepticons shoot them down. And they fight. And fight. And fight. And K throws Savoy off a building. Ouch. And the robots continue to fight. And fight. And Lockdown shows up because he realized Prime had phoned the coop. And they fight. And they fight. Dear God, they are really dragging this shit out. How long can one battle go on? In a way, I kind of feel bad for complaining about this because the special effects here are excellent and the action is actually very well shot. That's one thing Michael Bay does better than most. But it just doesn't feel nearly as epic as its length would imply. I can't quite put my finger on why, but something about it just feels... aimless. Like it's long just for the sake of being long. Meanwhile, Optimus discovers the ship they stole from Lockdown is actually a prison ship where he keeps his bounty. And among them, he discovers... The Dinobots! The Dinobots have finally made their appearance in this movie. I have been waiting for this moment for so very long. And they completely fucked it up! Now, I don't know about you, but I grew up with the 1980s Transformers animated series, and the Dinobots were some of my favorite characters, their leader Grimlock in particular. He was simple-minded, he was a badass that transformed into a T-Rex, and his dialogue was hilarious. I never thought I'd be so happy to see those big bozos. Me Grimlock, no bozo, me king! And in Age of Extinction... The Dinobots don't talk. I'm gonna say that again. The Dinobots don't 
talk. Every ounce of personality has been completely drained from them and they are nothing but big dumb animals. Mr. Bay, Mr. Kruger, and everyone else who worked on this film, there are only so many ways that my childhood can say fuck you! So, yeah, I'm not at all happy with what this movie did to the Dinobots, though I will admit the image of Optimus Prime charging into battle on Grimlock's back while wielding a giant sword is stupidly awesome. In any case, the Autobots and our human heroes managed to fight off Galvatron's forces and kill off Lockdown and Attinger. And Galvatron just... leaves. Yeah, he just kind of walks off the movie. Come to think of it, he didn't really do much in the final battle. He took control of all the KSI robots and then just made them do all the work. And when they failed, he was just like, well, guess I'll be going now. Just Why? It almost makes me wonder if he wasn't originally supposed to be in this movie and they threw him in at the last minute. And our story ends with Optimus Prime blasting off into space to search for the Creators. Because he apparently can do that now. And that's Transformers Age of Extinction. And for better or worse, it was pretty much what I expected. A big dumb action movie with a nonsensical plot, lots of explosions, too much focus on the human characters, and not enough on the robots the movie is named after. You know, like the last three movies. That being said, it's not all bad. As usual, the visual effects were outstanding and the acting was actually pretty decent for the most part. I thought Grammar and Tucci were particularly good in this and Marky Mark was a welcome addition to the cast as well. Like I said, he actually looks like an action star. If that were Shia LaBeouf trying to fight a robot 10 times his size with an alien gun, it would have looked fucking ridiculous. But when Wahlberg is helping Optimus Prime take on Lockdown, I actually buy it. This movie's Rotten Tomatoes score would lead you to believe it is the worst movie in the series, but honestly, I don't agree. I think it's actually one of the better ones. I realize that's not saying much, and it's definitely not a good movie, but it could have been much worse. Nevertheless, it was bad enough to pick up a Worst Picture nomination for this year's Golden Raspberry Awards, and next time, we're gonna look at another Worst Picture nominee because I definitely can't leave this movie behind. Till next time, I'm the Smeghead, and Hollywood can suck it.